Hi, my name is Haley Lindsay, and uh, I am a PhD student at the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. And today I will be presenting on uh, a technique that we're trying out. Um, it's very open-ended, and I would love to hear uh, any comments or concerns that people see. But uh, today we've talked a lot about data and the importance of data when it comes to doing different things in terms of this mental health and physical health sector for NLP. And so one of the things that we've talked about is how difficult it is to collect data. And so that's what we're trying to tackle in this. So the presentation is called Towards Exploiting ASR Error for Generating Synthetic Clinical Speech Data. And let's get started. So we typically start with a clinical speech research pipeline that looks something like this. Uh, a clinician goes and collects some speech. Uh, typically, uh, we work with pathological data, so um, maybe more like a clinical task, not so open-ended free speech. And then this gets transcribed either manually or with automatic speech recognition. And then after that, we extract some features either from the voice signal or from that uh, manually or ASR transcribed data, uh, usually features that clinicians are interested in that we've discussed with them that could be interesting. And then after that, we have some sort of downstream application where we try to build a machine learning model to see can we classify something. So the example we typically work with is can we diagnose cognitive impairment from speech or can we diagnose dementia over the phone? So when we start with that clinical speech, we usually look like uh, look at a task. Uh, this is the semantic verbal fluency, uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, and it goes something along the lines of name as many animals as you can in 60 seconds. Typically, I would pick someone from the audience and make them come do this, but today you're all off the hook. <laughs> and it would look something, oh no. There's circles there, just imagine. Uh, <laughs> and it would look something like this, so people would say something like dog, cat, lion. Uh, you typically get one minute, oh, 60 seconds is there. One minute for the task. And then after that, we would compute some features. So the way that people approach this task and what makes it a clinical task is that there is a strategy that happens behind when this is going on. So people would say something like dog, cat, uh, lion, cheetah, tiger frog, snake, and then you can see from that dog, cat, or maybe pets, so this is kind of a, a cluster there, uh, lion, cheetah, tiger, big cats, things we go there, cat could also maybe be in there, frog, snake, it's all somehow related, and we typically compute these clusters uh, automatically. In this case, we did. We use fast text models. We see how close each word is by the cosine distance, if you were paying attention earlier. And then we create a threshold, and that's how we determine these clusters automatically, and we say, this comes from the clinical literature, that if you know your cluster is a certain size, then uh, you have a semantic memory problem, <coughs> so sorry, or if you're switching between clusters, then you have a problem with your executive function. You can't tell when you've said enough words to exploit the next cluster. Now there's lots of ways that you can actually go about analyzing this task. We also do, um, <coughs> I am so sorry, one second. Oh, that's not mine. Something caught. Anyways, so there's also a temporal way that you can look at this. For instance, if you said something like a <coughs> moose flying squirrel, then you probably, my gosh, I'm very sorry. <coughs> it's not COVID, I swear. <coughs> I have really bad allergies. Okay. If you watched Rocky and Bullwinkle as a kid, you might understand why flying squirrel and moose would be together, and this is something that would be uh, captured by, say, something like a temporal cluster, where we look at how long you pause in between each word, and then we say that goes into a cluster. And then instead of having a semantic threshold there, we have a temporal threshold. And from that, we can compute lots of different features, how semantically related the words are, how long you spend in each cluster. It's just one example of the features that we would do. And then this gets thrown into that downstream application where we say, do you have dementia or not? Do you have some form of cognitive impairment or not? But clinical data is expensive, very hard to collect, um, and we run into a lot of problems we can't even really share between sites. We sometimes can't even share between project partners. And so that's where we run into this idea of, um, synthetic data generation. And so how do we synthetically generate data? Well, we do what all good computational linguists do. We go uh, see what computer vision is doing. 
And so uh, typic or, uh, there's a couple different techniques that have um, arisen in computer vision, and one of them would be flipping or rotating an image. And another is a technique called random erasing, where they, uh, this was actually used to tackle overfitting in models, where they try to delete random parts of the image and then they train on this data. And you can see in both cases, we have one image in our original, but we can generate a whole bunch of images after this from that one image. Now we have augmented our data with the synthetic data. And so that's the technique that we wanted to try, but how do you apply this to speech? What is the, how, how do you do this? And that was one of the things that we were considering. So we talked about this transcri transcription stage where we have uh, automatic speech recognition and a manual transcript. And when we look into ASR, there uh, is always some form of error in between the original and what gets transcribed. And there are three different types of error when you look at this, insertion where you add a word, substitution where you pick the wrong word, or deletion. And deletion, especially in our case where we have a random list of animals, is the most common form of error that we have. And so we've actually looked at, can we use ASR versus manual data? And we found no performance difference uh, when it came to classifying with the SVF between the demented and uh, not demented case. So how do we do this here? Well, we say there were 10 words here and uh, we had a 20% error rate. Uh, we would just go through and randomly delete two words. And for this experiment, we actually went through and permutated every possible combination of how you could delete the word error rate level from each of these. And uh, then this is what we did. We generated fake transcripts off of that. Uh, so here is our experiment. So for the clinical speech, uh, we had a semantic verbal fluency from 100 Dutch speakers, 50 healthy controls, 50 um, mild cognitive impairment, which is, this is the stage where everyone is interested in dementia because there's no cure for dementia. So we typically look at how do you prevent symptoms from getting worse? You do this by catching dementia earlier. And that stage is called mild cognitive impairment. Disclaimer, not all MCI patients will become demented, but that's for a different day. Uh, so then we both manually transcribed and used ASR and we computed the word error rate that we discussed earlier. And then we augmented our data. So we took the word error rate by person and then we deleted randomly from each of their transcripts and generated new transcripts off of that. So we actually generated every possible combination. We then printed a thousand of these, selected those randomly, and then we actually extract features from 10 of those just for the sake of a feasibility experiment. So then we compute those features that we discussed earlier, temporal, semantic, binning, all kinds of different things. If you're interested in this, please feel free to talk to me. I love talking about it. And then we tried uh, to train some models to see if this actually worked for the use case that we were interested in. And so what did we do? We trained on synthetic data and then we tested on that ASR data. So this is our population breakdown. Um, we had 50 healthy controls, 50 people with mild cognitive impairment. Um, we had 18 male, 32 female, uh, 19 male, 31 female. Sorry, that's missing from the slide. Um, we actually do have a significant age difference here, which would typically be an issue in this kind of experimentation. But since we're looking at two different baseline techniques and not how good are we at classifying, we uh, considered it. Um, it's worth noting that the MMSE is uh, the mini mental state examination. That's how the uh, cognitive impairment was determined or not. So you can see there's not a great difference here. So these people are not heavily cognitively impaired. This is a very difficult task. And then we have the word error rate, which was 20.29% uh, for the healthy controls and 23.13% for the mild cognitive impaired. So then yes, we generate uh, 10 synthetic files um, based on the word error rate. Uh, we just did some very basic modeling here, uh, logistic regression. We did a leave one out cross validation and then uh, we train on the 990 synthetic files. We remove all of the person that we're testing and we just test on their one true file. And um, we did univariate feature selection. I could tell you that there's a whole bunch of reasons but it's because that's how the image appeared in my mind. Um, except for the lines are missing. Anyways, so then we have our results based on this data. And so when we first saw our results, we were a little bit disappointed. We were kind of hoping for a, um, an increase in our performance, but then we thought about it for a minute and we don't actually want an increase from our performance in this case. What we're trying to do is simulate synthetic data based on a true data set. So what we actually wanna see is similar performance on our synthetic and our true data. So you can see the red line here is our um, true data and the blue line is our synthetic data. Um, one thing that we found really interesting from this is that um, when we generate more data, 10 files per person, we actually see that our um, more in-depth features that uh, 
we use become more relevant in this case. So more data, you need more features to represent it, um, especially because there might be some overfitting here since we're just deleting random things. But this was interesting that we were basically able to simulate the same performance that we saw um, with our ASR data. Um, our future work is to try to now use some bigger, larger models that you know you can do if you don't have 100 people, maybe 1,000, maybe 10,000, see how much data can we add, what does this mean, and can, is this a viable option for generating that synthetic data. Um, and uh, as a side note, this should also be tried in additional languages and diagnoses to see if this is something that can be used widely. Thanks, my name's Haley. Um, yeah. Thank you. We have some time for question and discussion. Who wants to start? Um, did I understand correctly that you sort of augmented the data, um, but you used the original files, or maybe I, I missed? I might have glossed over that a little too quickly. So we, I don't know where it is. Um, we manually and use ASR to transcribe the data and we generate the data from the manual. So we take the ASR, the word error rate deletion rate, and we do this from the manual transcripts because that's also what we're feeding into the ASR. Thanks. So yeah, we don't technically test on that data. Uh, clarification. You said you have 50 Dutch speakers. They were speaking Dutch or English? Dutch. Ah, okay. <laughs> that explains the high word error rate. So yes, thanks. yes, yes. Uh, we work in some lower resource languages, so it gets difficult. Granted, Dutch isn't that low resource compared to some others. Uh -huh. Thank you very much for this talk. I'm, I don't know if it, <laughs> I haven't listened correctly, but I'm can you again explain why you're doing this? Why you're <laughs> inventing new data? I'm, I, I really, I'm stunned and it's, it's really great, but do you, do, why do you do this? Can you yeah, just yeah. explain a little bit Absolutely. more? Absolutely. So data is really expensive to collect. Like I've been waiting on these 100 speakers for three years. It's a long time to wait for 100 people and then still 100 people if you try to do anything beyond maybe some random forest algorithms or if you want to do anything neural, it's not really an option. Uh, so one of the ideas when it comes to generating data is that it would give us the ability to use maybe some more complex models. Can we get better classification performance if we have more data? But then we also have this issue of like, uh, it, we even have more data, but I can't get it because the project was over before we collected the data, which means we no longer have access to the data. But if you could generate some form of synthetic data from that data that approximated it, then I don't know if it's if we can or not, but it could become a possibility then to see the rest of the data. So it's just, there's a lot of issues that arise when you work with clinical data for good reasons. People's privacy is extremely important, right? So this is uh, something that we're trying to work with. How do you work under GDPR but still do good and fascinating research? One more question here. I can, I can give explanation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and, and I have a question to you as well. Well, you know, uh, the privacy. If you, if you want to work with even us who are working in a hospital, if we, if we want to do a research with the patient's data, we need the general consent of the patient. If we don't have that, we are not allowed to touch the data. Unless there is diagnostics, etc. but no research. So, and we've, we've been facing the same, the same uh, problem. And that's why my question, is your model somehow, somewhere available? <laughs> it's, it's not a, it's not a, well, it's, it's not a, I'm, I'm not it trying to buy it. No, 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 no. I have no money for that, but it's I'm interesting. I'm not selling, but I, I, we do a lot of free open research at DFKI. Um, it is not publicly available. It's on a, a local thing, but uh, mainly because we also plan on publishing a paper on it, but if yes. you're interested, please, yeah, please contact me. More than happy. Great. <laughs>
More questions? Yes. It's more sharing slash. Uh, let's talk about it later as well. <laughs> uh, because uh, um, I'm volunteering in Mozilla. I don't know if you're aware of the Common Voice uh, project. No. no so yet. basically, is a is a is a collective data set of voices created together, and uh, is for uh, Mozilla is very strong in diversity. So is uh, all the languages, including Dutch. I was checking the data set that could be downloaded. Uh, basically, uh, a community. Now there is a very all quite all the language, not all the languages in the world, but a lot. And uh, basically, a population can uh, provide uh, a data set of sentences, and then the people can. Uh, uh, purposely, so GDPR, okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, can uh, record their voice or validate other people's voices. And uh, actually, this project was built uh, uh, as a response of an uh, open source uh, uh, model for uh, this speech, speech recognition. Now it's speech recognition and speech to text. And um, yeah, the first question is uh, if you know about uh, that. And uh, uh, these things about data augmentation, I think, can help. Uh, each other's and uh, uh, something that is very interesting and eventually to build one, uh, because I talked with uh, a friend in medicine, uh, a data set of uh, sentences related, um, topic related, so for medicine, etc. because it's something that is lacking. Like we talk about uh, with uh, different people in uh, telecommunication or linguistics to gather in the data about voices and the problem is uh, <laughs> the GDPR, etc. So uh, yeah, I think uh, it's great to, yeah, I can yeah, share yeah, more about that. But very uh, yeah. interesting. <laughs> we should talk about this afterwards because I would be interested, especially with like open source, like in-house ASR stuff. We're working on this because GDPR is very specific, right? We're lucky that this was manually transcribed and then we had somebody actually go and get the ASR for us. So this was, yeah, tricky with clinical data because they don't want you using Google Cloud. <laughs> very interesting hint, thanks. More questions or remarks, yeah? Yeah, thank you for a nice presentation. Uh, it's not a question, but maybe a uh, suggestion. I, I think, I don't know how big is your data itself, because it's a 50, uh, 50 people, but uh, probably it could be long. And normally uh, data augmentation or uh, that kind of techniques normally works well with the small size data set. So if you explore like differentiating a uh, size of your data set, you might exp that discovered that your algorithm actually works with this very small size of training data set. So. This is something we are exploring, and if you're interested, I have some preliminary results. I just don't have it on the slides because hopefully it ends up in a paper. Yeah, we can uh, discuss. Also, just to start promoting, I have a poster session there uh, specifically talking about data augmentation, active learning, so let's, let's talk, talk uh, tomorrow maybe. This is great. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I think we have time for one more question? Seems not to be the case, then thanks a lot to the speaker. Thank you guys. Oh, oh, oh.